<clears throat> All right, welcome everybody officially to our now live on Facebook open mic night here from the Pat Conroy Literary Center, Beaufort, South Carolina. We've got a great group of writers coming from all over the low country and a few from beyond it tonight as well. Our open mic night is presented every month in partnership with the South Carolina Writers Association, our statewide writers group. It's a partnership that we very much value here at the Conroy Center. And I am excited to share all of the participating writers with you tonight. Our featured writer who will close out the show is John McElroy. Mac has a brand new book out called Whatever Happens Probably Will. And uh, we will take that as our unofficial theme for the evening as well. All right, Mac, so pressure's on when we get to you. I mean, the bar is going to be set pretty high by that point because we've got a really talented group of writers tonight. And we're going to begin with our friend Niles Reddick. Niles, are you ready to read something for ready us? Ready to go, man. Thank you. Um, I have two small pieces, flash <laughs> fiction pieces. The first is titled Back in My Day. It'll come out uh, in the spring in right hand pointing. Um, Back in My Day. Dad brought home an empty cardboard box from work and put it on the living room floor. Why did you bring that home, Mom asked. For the kids, Dad said. You don't know where it's been, she said. <laughs> we didn't care where it had been, but the three of us piled in it and sat in a row for a bumpy ride, bus ride across town to Sears candy counter, then piloted a swooping jet to drop bombs in the jungles of Vietnam until we were shot down like our Uncle Ray, and then drove a dune buggy to beat to the beach and zigzag the wet sand to avoid the washed up jellyfish, seaweed, and broken shells. I'll put it out in the trash tomorrow, Mom said, not really meaning it. <laughs> the next piece is a short flash fiction piece also, uh, titled The Mandela Effect. After five o'clock, we got together at La Siesta for margaritas, fajitas, and tacos to celebrate Cinco de Mayo, and someone asked what the holiday represented. None of us cared what it meant other than eating great food and more importantly, drinking margaritas, but we all thought it was to commemorate Mexico's Independence Day, a victory over Spain. Marty, the human resources manager in our group, corrected that it was to celebrate Mexico's victory of a French occupation, and that our mistake was yet another example the false memories of a group referred to as the Mandela effect, named so after people who'd had an incorrect memory of Nelson Mandela dying in an African prison when he hadn't. Marty shared other examples that seemed less significant. People remembered the name of Jif Peanut Butter as Jiffy. Curious George had a tale when he didn't. The theme song for Mr. Rogers was It's a Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood when it was It's a Beautiful Day in This Neighborhood. And Hannibal Lecter said to Clarice Starling in Silence of the Lambs, Hello, Clarice, when in fact he simply said, Good morning. Get out, Frenchie said. That movie scared the hell out of me. 100% all true, Marty said. It's even true individually. What people say in interviews about their own experience in previous jobs seems to be false memories compared to the reports from their supervisors when we check. You're kidding, Jan commented. How do you know the former supervisors are telling you the truth? We don't, but we have to find some middle ground, Marty said. I've come to wonder what reality is. Well, the reality is these are the best damn margaritas I've ever had, Frenchie said, and everyone laughed except for the ones you had last week that you don't recall because you had so many, Jan said. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Niles. Uh, as I know, because I have had the gift of, uh, of seeing an advance galley for it, you've got a new book coming out. Would you like to tell the group a little something about that? Uh, it's 40 something flash fiction pieces, I think 48, the title is It's Not, uh, If Not For You, which is the title of the last story in the book, um, which is a beautiful story, really. 
And um, it's being published by uh, Big Table Publishing out of Boston and San Francisco. So I'm, I'm pretty excited. This is my third collection of short fiction. Uh, I have two novels also, but I'm looking forward to that. And then the next one will be titled, Who's Going to Pray for Me Now? Oh, Thanks. Nice. Congratulations. Thank Can't you. wait to read it. Can't wait to buy it and read it. Niles, you mean I've been going around for 25 years saying, hello, Clarice. You never <laughs> said that? It's, it is true. It is absolutely true. Um, sure? The Mandela effect. Now, he may have said it at some point in the film, but oh, not okay. at the point people remember. Yeah. People remember in Empire Strikes Back, Darth Vader saying, Luke, I am your father. That's not that's not the line. The line that's, is, no, I'm your father. That's absolutely right. <clears throat> Lots of interesting examples from pop culture about that. All right, next up in our lineup tonight, um, a poet long absent and very welcome back in our open mic, uh, Susan Madison, what would you like to read for us? I have two short poems and I haven't named either one of them. If you all want to email me, text me and message me and suggest names, I'm open to it. Um, this one I am dedicating and I hope June is watching to my dear friend, June, who I think this is very appropriate for her during this, this time. She just lost her husband. And then I found love, fearless <clears throat> love, uncut, no rocks, no watered down love. Run with the Holy Ghost love, no longer afraid of death love, imbued in peace love, self love. And then I found love, still waters in the face of fire love, chilled love. No desire for flesh love. And then I found love seeping through my pores, love, appetite filling love. I don't need you, but I love you, love. No one can abandon me, love. Jesus, Buddha, Muhammad, Eckhart type of love. Resurrect, resurrecting love. I could sell this stuff and be rich, love. Damn, this is some dope love. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, next, then yeah. the next one is um, I'm going to tentatively name it the poets. Our childhoods are eternal. The midwife cut our cords, but the veil from the world we left remains open. Because of this phenomena, we suffer indignities for the ant killed by the spider. Recover the butterfly that never became a butterfly. Mm. Rub the trunk of dying trees. We love lovers way past their expiration dates. We eulogize evil people and give tragedies to humor. At our best, we watch ourselves cry in the mirrors, on a rage, laugh until we cramp. We sip pearls for goodness in the heart of evil. Witness God pass through people and sit by the dying. Sometimes we pour shades down, bed up with whiskey and wine, and listen to the howls of blind blues singers on turntables. We try to stop at red lights, wear suitable clothes for our age, raise children like proper parents, and be good wives and daughters. It's useless though. The doors left open by the sage that visited our mother's bedside cannot be healed. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah. Wow. Beautiful. Nice. All Just right. a beautiful, beautiful way of putting things, Susan. Wow. You do. You so do. And she's given us a homework assignment. Remember, gang, we've got to come up with title selections for her suggestions. Yes. <clears throat> mm -hmm. oh. Beautiful work. Uh, is Robin back with us? There you are. Yes, I think we I thought we lost you for just a second. We did. We just had a thunderstorm come through. So I've got my scared doggy next to me <laughs> and I went away, <laughs> but I'm back and I think it's mostly gone. Um, this is something I just wrote last week and um, it doesn't have a title. So maybe y'all can help with that too. The summer sun was hot, white, blinding. 
the kind of sun that leaves light squiggles in the aqueous humor of your eyes. It was so humid, I felt like I needed scuba gear to breathe. Occasionally, a dandelion fluff of cloud would pass over the sun, and for a moment, I'd anticipate relief, only to feel the blaze heat up again like a candle after the wind dies down. People were milling around the field everywhere, watching, waiting, eye protective glasses at the ready, dark shields to keep them from being hurt by the very thing they can't live without, afraid to be blinded by the very thing that enables them to see. Blankets were scattered across the dry, crisp grass like bright patches of a quilt. The grass crunched as I walked, carrying my soft red blanket. My small yellow pack patted my back with each step. I needed to find a secret place away from the people chattering, the kids giggling, and the acrid smell of lunches growing too hot in the sun, a hidden place that was open enough to see the sky. I couldn't find it. I couldn't find the right place to experience this once in a lifetime event until I noticed a large oak tree at the edge of the field. It stood, stood there ready to greet me. I ran over, threw my blanket in its shadow, then reached up to climb into its arms. Maybe, just maybe, I could find a spot high enough that I could see a big swatch of the sky. I climbed, hand foot hand, higher and higher, the warm, rough bark kept my sweaty palms from slipping. The leaves brushed my skin, soothing the anxiety that we all felt. Anxiety? Somewhere deep inside of me was that priority, primordial feeling that the light meant safety, and that without it, if only for a few moments, I was somehow more vulnerable. Do the others feel this? Do the children? Does this tree? Finally, I found it open sky above a branch large enough to hold my weight with one below to brace my right foot. I dangled the other foot and had a flash of how much I loved climbing when I was a child. Do kids do that anymore? I hoped so. Ooh, Almost it. done. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> Secure then, I gently pulled my backpack off and opened it, looking for the certified dark glasses I had put there. I had packed two pair. I put one on, then to test it, I looked up at the spotlight sun. When I looked back down to find my power bar, the backpack was dark abyss. I had to remove the glasses to retrieve my snack. I munched on the bar and checked my watch. I had made it just in time. A few more minutes and it would start. The anxiety changed to excitement, the kind that makes a few minutes seem like forever. Then it happened. The moon's shadow took a tiny nip out of the sun, a baby nip like the ones I would sneak when grandma made her best chocolate cookies. The nip slowly turned into a bite, and then the bite changed into a soft gray blanket that was pulled slowly over the sun's bright face. Everything went still. A few more minutes and it would start. The anxiety, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> the wind stopped, the birds quieted, even the bug's high-pitched hum hushed. The bright, the bright, busy light became a silky twilight, then a silent night. And with the grayness came the whispered hush I so desperately needed. A few quiet moments without artificial lights and stories that strobed on too many screens screaming at me, look at me, look over here, pay attention or you will die. <laughs> oh, very good. Thank you. Robin, when you write about children or for children, you do this beautiful thing where you balance observation and innocence and it just, came through perfectly in, in that passage. That was that was so well done. Thank you for sharing that tonight. Thank you. Our next uh, our next three readers will be Denise, Barry, and then June. So Denise, are you ready for us? Yes, I am. Um, I have two pieces. The first is called Outside the Door. Outside the Door sat her belongings. Leaving meant she would have less money, but more security, less personal danger, but more personal growth, less shouting, but more peace. Outside the door was accusation. Leaving meant she seemed stretched and wretched. He claimed she was the abuser. He claimed she was the cause of his cheating. He lied to save his reputation, damaging hers. Outside the door was self-loathing. Leaving meant she had failed. 
useless as a crumpled page tossed into the bin, useless as a shattered windshield still there, but of no value. But outside the door was healing, leaving meant immediate relief. Her child could thrive again, her control could be restored, her resentment could fade. Outside the door waited hope. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. My second one is a new one. I wrote it specifically for my mother. It is called alabaster. <clears throat> Her skin is alabaster, translucent, magnificent. It always has been. Though the changes through the years were inescapable and beautiful in the stories they tell, some things never change. Lines deepen as the bed of a river carved by the continual life flow from mountaintop to the sea. Golden spots appear as the jealous sun desires to glow from this lovely face and not just from the atmosphere. Softness has been her hallmark. Hands that touched the baby's head were soft as the infant child. A kiss on her cheek surprises the breeze which can never be as delicate as she. From nine months to 90 years, the hard work of life, and there was much, did not transform the suppleness of her touch. Of the many descriptions of this soul, which I gratefully and perpetually recall, the miracle of her softness is pondered most of all. Oh, lovely. Your mother must be very proud of you, Denise. <laughs> My mother is amazing. I'm very grateful. Very, very beautiful. Are that beautifully with your poetry, Denise. That, Thank you. That was lovely. Very, very, very powerful. Thank you for doing that. Thank you. <clears throat> Barry? Yes, sir. Good evening, everyone. What will you be sharing with us this evening? Well, I've gone the prose direction this evening, and I have a piece from uh, my collection of micro memoirs, something I wouldn't dare read if Vivian was still running the show, because it's <laughs> only <the> three minutes. <laughs> um, the the uh, micro memoirs is a collection called Barry Who, 33 unforgettable micro memoirs from someone you never heard of. And it's real stories from life. And this one sort of, I guess, reminds me a little bit of the old Reader's Digest character sketches. And uh, they all come with a date. This one is mid fifties and it's called the Human Encyclopedia. I had the usual sports heroes, Mickey Mantle, Jim Brown, Wilt Chamberlain, Merv Connor. What's that? Who's Merv Connor? What's the matter with you? He's only the guy who provided our whole town, maybe our whole county, with any sports statistic you could ever want on demand. You'd walk away asking yourself, how does this guy know every batting average, yards per carry, points per game, to the decimal point? How in his 37.5 years, as he put it, did he accumulate so much data? One time, during a break in the high holiday services, a bunch of us kids were outside discussing Jim Brown. <clears throat> Someone asked us, what was his yards per carry last year? Almost five, I said. No way, said Frankie, not even four. Ordinarily, this would become a big, how much you want to bet argument between two young males. Not with Merv 20 feet away. As always, he was separate from us kids, yet not quite with the adults either. Hey, Merv, what was Jim Brown's yards for carry? I called out. 5.23, season total 1,019. He answered in his rapid fire, no need to even think about it manner. Amazing, I thought. Another time at a track meet, we were discussing the 56 Olympics. Merv, what country has won the most Olympic shot put medals? Soviet Union, Bulgaria, second. I just looked at him. 
This guy actually knows Olympic shot put records? Really? Once, someone asked which was the first major league team to draw a million fans. Detroit Tigers, 1930, 1,154,066. <laughs> Holy shit, I said, foul mouth kid that I was. And so it went throughout my childhood. Outside that house of worship, at community picnics, high school games, spaghetti socials, Merv, the human encyclopedia, as he was known in town, was there at the ready. On April 17th, 1960, I woke up to the big news. Not another Sputnik launch or an update on Jackie's pregnancy. This was bigger. Rocky Calavito had been traded for Harvey Keene, a superstar for superstar swap between the Tigers and Indians. Stunner. I read every article, listened to every news report. It took all of about one hour for my friend Cliff and me to get into the first argument. I was fully prepared, armed with facts, to defend my view that the Tigers got the better of the deal, landing Calavito. That weekend, there was a big event in the old hometown, the annual hayride. We kids gathered near the hot dog grill, Merv over by the boiling corn. <clears throat> it didn't take long for the alliterative Calavito Keen controversy to commence. <laughs> hey, Merv, what did Calavito hit last year? Howie asked. 248, he responded. Rapid fire, of course. I stared at him a moment and turned that over in my brain. 248? Did he say 248? Did you say 248, I called out? Didn't Calavito hit 259? 248, 259, somewhere in there. He shrugged <laughs> dismissively. Wait, what? What just happened? <laughs> Did the human encyclopedia just say somewhere in there? Not a phrase you see a lot in Encyclopedia Britannica. <laughs> Everyone in earshot froze. Hot dogs stopped in midair just short of kids' open mouths. Adults looked confused. I remember a couple of them stared at me. What the hell do you want from me, I thought. Gee, sorry for reading the sports page. <clears throat> I couldn't wait to get home, headed straight for my sports books. I was almost afraid to look. Sure enough, Jim Brown's rushing average wasn't 5.3. It was 4.7. The Soviet Union was not the all-time shot put medalist. It was the good old US of A. Bulgaria, not so much as a bronze. The first team to a million in attendance was not the 1930. Tigers. It was the 20 Yankees and their new drawing card, a kid named Babe Ruth. As I lay there on my bed that night, I remember exactly how I felt. I wasn't the least bit angry at Merv. You didn't have to be a grown up to understand that he just wanted to be included. The human encyclopedia turned out to be more human than encyclopedia. Oh. That's a new one, Barry. Never heard that one. Yeah, you know, it's it's not new. It's the same age as most of the others. But I read <laughs> it once to a small group, and people looked like they were falling asleep with all the bake the sports statistics. So I put it away, and I just dragged okay. it out recently. Very, very sweet. I love the ending. Thank you. <laughs> Reads beautifully, Barry. That yeah. is great. That, that Thank has you. a real heartbeat to it. I'm so glad you shared that tonight. Thank you. Glad you guys liked it because I was a little worried about it. <laughs> I just saw people hearing 3.47 and like. <laughs> <laughs> it was the right story, but for the wrong audience. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. Yes. Nobody snores when you read, Barry. Thank yeah. you. Well said, Denise. There's something about baseball and, and sports reporting in general that's just fascinating to me. You know, the guys, you can tell they're lit up a little bit or they're grinning or, you know, this sounds very familiar. And the rest of us are like, I know there's a story here. But um, some of the best writers are sports writers. Um, Good. 
Uh, well, Terry Kay, I think, was a sports writer at one point. He also did uh, speech and drama. <clears throat> Lou Grizzard was a sports writer. It was also <clears throat> humorous. So there's something about it that's maybe it's the grounding effect. You can't be talking about anything except balls hitting, you know, bets hitting balls. And yet there's some other action going on. This is interesting. We have two new folks in the Zoom room. Uh, welcome, Jane Zenger, my friend. Hi, good to see you. And Catherine Burnham is with us as well. Hi, Catherine, welcome. <clears throat> uh, are you two planning on reading tonight or are you just hanging out with us? I'd love to read something if, if there's room and time. I'm sorry, I just got on. I had a meeting in town. I apologize. Right. I'm glad you could make it, Jane. I will, I will you. add you into the, the lineup. How about you, Catherine? I'd certainly love to read. Absolutely. I will add you both in. <clears throat> our next reader uh, in our sequence already is June, who is joining us for the very first time tonight as well. And then we have Brad and then Jane Adams, and I will add everybody else uh, after that. So June, are you ready to read something for us? I am. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Well, hello, everybody. I'm reading uh, a couple of pages from a short story called Scheherazade. It uh, is the winner of the 2022 Pub City Endless Prize. Is that all there is? Jake lowers the manuscript and peers over his glasses at me. It makes him look like a middle-aged owl, and I don't much like owls. Don't tell me they're wise. Nothing wise eats rats. I frown. What do you mean is that all he is? There are 32 pages there, double-spaced, grammatically correct, and typo-free. I mean, what happens to Flynn? Does he make it or not? I shrug. How should I know? Well, you wrote it. A sigh of exasperation escapes my lips. Yeah. I wrote it. I tried to kill that son of a bitch off on page 13, but he wanted to live. Jake grins. Maybe 13's his lucky number. Yeah, maybe. I never have figured out why everybody's so afraid of it. Some people won't go to the store on Friday the 13th to get a quart of milk, even if they have to eat their shredded wheat dry next morning. It's not the 13th you have to worry about. It's all those other days. Aren't you the woman who used to toss Phil's thought over her shoulder? Do you defy fate now and walk under ladders? I chuckle, he's got me. Yeah, every chance I get. Break mirrors? I figure by now I've got 70 years of bad luck accumulated. Jack smiles. Which means you'll have to live at least that long to work through it. I shudder. 129? God forbid. You're a liar, Reed. If you could, you'd live forever, no matter how uncomfortable it was. I look at him and frown. I really hate it when he's right. I can't imagine the world without me. I can't bear the thought that it will go on spinning just the same. I'd like to believe there is a life, a world beyond this one, but I can't. God knows I've tried. I'm hungry and I don't want to cook. Me neither. Where do you want to go? He asked me this, not really wanting to know the answer. Just the way he asked about Flynn. Lately, we end up in the same place. Him because it's got good burgers. Me from sheer inertia. I can imagine a thousand responses to the question, though. How about a little outdoor cafe on the left bank of the sign? A hundred years ago. Crusty bread, ripe cheese, and old wine with Mo Digliani for company. An English pub would be nice, somewhere in the fence. We could toast each other with a pint of Guinness, take of a little bubble and squeak. There'd be a peat fire on the hearth whose heat doesn't reach beyond the first few feet, so that your face is warm and your back chilly, and there would be a dot board on the spoke wrench walls. Or we could just try that Mexican restaurant across the street from our usual place. Doesn't matter. Thank, Thank you, Joe. 
Congratulations on Hub City. Very nice. Thank you. That's not a small prize to have won. That's great. Takes all of about a half a sentence to realize what a good writer you are. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you. And do you have the stories in publication as well? Uh, yes, I've had uh, some um, in the pedigree review and also a couple of poems and past issues. Yeah. I'm so glad you joined us tonight. I hope you come back. Please do. Thank you. All right. If my list is correct, it is that wonderful time in the evening when we get to see both Brad and Elvis on screen together. <laughs> you're, you're muted, Brad. You got to unmute for us. How's that? <clears throat> got it. Yeah. Well, this is kind of Elvis appropriate, actually. <laughs> I got it. I've got a. Um... I guess it's creative nonfiction, but I think it could be a micro memoir. I really like that idea, very <laughs> micro me memoir. And uh, I, I wrote this knowing that the theme tonight was whatever happens will, of course. <laughs> it's called uh, it's called drunk CDs, drunk CDs. <clears throat> the flat thin cardboard like squares were tucked away in between the CDs, like they were trying to hide from me. They're slightly smaller than the plastic case CDs, but can pack a dose of no nostalgic joy even bigger than my favorite higher priced hard case versions. It's not just the music. Like a door to my happy place, they can transport me back to the joy of an experience where the music is just the start, a catalyst for more. That is, if I can remember how to open the door. I've yet to find one of these cardboard classics that wasn't purchased directly from the band or artist in between sets at some bar. They all share a common purchase behavior that brought them into my collection. Late at night, late into the performance, and well into the over-refreshment that likely inspired the whole thing, drunk CDs. <laughs> Thanks to Pandora, Spotify, and Sirius XM streaming radio, I don't listen to CDs very much these days. I've even brushed off my old, or should I say classic, vinyl record collection and purchased some new, brand new classic albums. CDs have fallen into the no man's land between new digital technology and old, now cool again, vinyl record albums. It's a good time to purge, reorganize, or most likely stash my CD collection somewhere where my children will find it and have to deal with it after I die. No way I can part with a single CD while I'm alive. At least I'll put them in alphabetical order to impress the kids when they make this estate discovery. By the last name of the artist? First name? First <laughs> letter of the band's name? Album name? Let's see, Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band. B.B. King and Eric Clapton album titled Riding with the King. Hmm. Going through my stacks of plastic case discs, I rediscovered a range of these cardboard covered memory catalysts. It was like watching a home movie of some life's highlights, many of which I would have not wanted on record. Sometimes I could instantly recognize the name of the musician or the band, remember the bar, the art on the cover, or recall a particular song. Sometimes I'd have to play it once or twice to give my memory bank time and adequate stimulus to reconnect some of the synapses that may never have been fully connected in the first place. Sometimes I didn't have a clue, probably one of the closing time purchases. When all the drunk CDs were out of hiding, I found there were at least six that were identical. This wasn't a discounted volume purchase, buy five and get one free, although I could have been often vulnerable to such deals. It was the Steel Your Heart Band, that's S-T-E-E-L. And I vividly crawled that they sure did at each of the six or so annual purchases I had made. Steel drums, Christmas carols, sixth graders, drag queens and drunks. How could your heart not skip a beat and your hand not reach for your wallet? <laughs> Christmas time in Key West is magically wonderful and absurdly weird. In sync with this funky fusion, the sixth graders of the Steel Your Heart Band perform steel drum versions of Christmas carols every year at the Schooner Wharf Bar, Key West Watering Hole Institution and one of my favorites. 
following the house band set who had played songs like She's Got a Butt and Get Greta's Greatest Tits. The sixth graders and their instructors cleared a few empty beer bottles off the stage and set up a keyboard and steel drums. With the vibe of a Caribbean beach Christmas party, the innocent children's voices echoed carols throughout the bar to the appreciative patrons of tourists, local drunks, drag queens in full holiday regalia, an assortment of characters that could have just walked out of a Hemingway novel. True to Key West tourist town's commerce tradition, while the children sang joy to the world, two 12-year-old band members circulated among the patrons offering Steal Your Heart Band CDs for $10. It didn't take a lubricated spirit for most to open their hearts and wallets to buy one, likely funding the band's budget for the new year. I hope to add another six or 10 of these to my drunk CD treasure chest. <laughs> now, I've got to start sorting out that stack of rock concert t-shirts. <laughs> you totally <laughs> captured Key West, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've had uh, enough experience to capture it more than I should have at times, probably. <laughs> That was fantastic. Such a wonderful visual, too, of those four innocent sixth graders having no <laughs> idea, no context for what's going on around them. But. Uh, well, I think, I, think, I think they might in Key West, even at that age. <laughs> yeah, it's, it was hard to, hard to capture. It was pretty, it was pretty amazing. Too, so. Don't sell it. Don't get rid of your CDs. You never know when it's going to yeah. become popular, like all my old yeah. vinyl. That's true. Yes, they are at my uh, younger relatives, and I don't get to listen to them. They listen to them all the time. Vinyl's really hot now. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if those kids hit the top 40 sometime, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I got rid of my vinyl when I moved south, and I've regretted it ever since. Well, I'll tell you, I've kept mine from college and just sort of tracked it. It's amazing how they're appreciating mm. the, the price. Mm. All right, we're going to our friend Jane Adams next, uh, then to Vivian, and then we will go to Jane Zenger, and then to Catherine, and then our big finish with Mac. So that, that will be moving forward, yes. So Jane, are you ready for us? I am. <clears throat> um, this is one of my latest chapters in the Boston Tales. Um, this takes place in July, 1975. And it's, um, I'm sorry, it's, a, it's kind of a serious one. It doesn't seem to fit tonight's mood, uh, <laughs> but it's the one I have up on the screen. <clears throat> um, it takes place after St. Pat's Day when uh, I read a lot of the stories here before. Um, St. Pat's Day when in South Boston, um, a young um, African-American girl was uh, beaten to death, uh, not to death, um, she uh, behind a bar on St. Pat's Day. Um, and um, this is six months later, July, 1975. A small woman emerged from Park Street Tea Station, part of the post-shift crowd disrode weekly afternoons from the city's transit system. She balanced the bundles she carried, then began to walk uphill through Liberty Mall at the east end of Boston Common. She wore sensible crepe sole shoes, moved slowly, as if burdened by more than the weight of her actual years. Other commuters rushed by her on both sides as she made her way. The unusual heat, unbearable in the trolleys, was, still wor was worse still on the street. Three quarters of the way to the top, she stopped again, easing her bags onto a bench and settling in next to them. She withdrew a handkerchief and dabbed at the sweat rolling from her hair and her forehead while she took in the view. To her right lay Beacon Street in the grand granite stake staircase leading to the gold domed state house, her destination today. A slight breeze came up. The branches of the towering trees overhead swayed and dappled the sun's light. She exhaled, feeling momentary relief from the temperature. Across from her sat a large bronze sculpture set in more granite, depicting a group of soldiers led by someone on a horse. She didn't recall ever noticing it before, though she'd come this way many, many times, school trips, 
demonstrations, all sorts of things over a lifetime lived in this city. When she felt rested enough to continue the ascent to Beacon, she stood, gathered her bags and walked closer to the memorial. I'll all be, she murmured, dedicated to Colonel Robert Shaw and his soldiers of the 54th Regiment. She read on and exclaimed aloud, says here a regiment of freed black soldiers led a Union attack in 1863. A French name she couldn't pronounce was listed as the sculptor. Imagine that. Did such a good job they put him right here in Liberty Mall by a Frenchman and everything. Mm -mm. Wonder what they think of what's going on here now. She shook her head slightly, picked up her bundles and stepped into the Beacon Street crossword walk. Once she reached the state house steps, she dropped everything and withdrew a poster board sign from one of the bags, unfolded it and untangled a thick yarn looped through the holes at its top. She placed the loop around her neck so the poster hung down across the front of her, straightening it lovingly. Next, she retrieved a votive candle in a blue plastic jar, the kind churches have to light for the dead, and a big lighter. She lit the candle and placed it on the step beside her and began to sing in a sorrowful church choir alto voice. Amazing, I'm not gonna sing for you. <laughs> Amazing grace, how sweet thou art. You saved a wretch like me. People brushed by paying her little attention, but slowly, one by one, a person here and there paused to see what was going on. Was she protesting, panhandling? Cars queued up and stopped at the intersection's traffic light. Passengers craned their necks through open windows to see what the scene was about. When anyone made notice of her, Shirley Johnson stepped closer and held her poster forward. On it, written in large black magic markers, letters, was the message, why did you kill my Jonelle? Centered beneath the words was a large glossy color school picture of Jonelle Johnson her cheeks scrub shiny, hair knotted tightly into two stiff braids, smile broad and genuine, eyes looking up as if in anticipation of a great present on Christmas morning. She wore the white blouse and tie that was part of a formal school uniform. People averted their eyes once they realized what inconvenient horror they beheld, something so awful it made them want to rush home at once to hug their kids. One woman opened her purse, fumbled for money, dropped a $5 bill at Shirley's feet, then turned and ran down Park Street. Shirley sang on. When she finished Amazing Grace, she launched into Swing Low Sweet Chariot. She sang and sang, <clears throat> stopping only briefly to dab at her eyes with a hanky she kept in her skirt pocket. She swayed as she sang, finding the motion hypnotic and comforting. She had no idea what else to do because she figured everything she really wanted to do would have gotten them both arrested. She wanted her husband to share her rage, to burn things down, to make people, to want to make people hurt as badly as they were hurting. She hated Randall right now for not needing to burn or hurt or scream or get revenge like she did. Randall, always the reasonable husband and steady father. How she berated him when he held her in his tightest hug in that hospital room whispering, everything that happens is God's will, Shirley. God's will, Randall, really? She had shrieked until hospital staff came running back to the room in alarm. She knew she had to find another way to vent her outrage and her sorrow. What she was doing today was all she could think to do for now. I'll leave it there. Kind of a, kind of a tough one. <laughs> Powerful stuff, Jane. Always amazing, Jane. Yes, always. always. Whoops, I lost you. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> we can see we can see you. Oh, well, I can't see you. <laughs> Wait a minute. Oh my lord. I don't know what I've done here. Help. <laughs> that was wonderful, Jane. I really love the way you tackle the Thank issues you. of that time mm -hmm. that are still I think, that they're still relevant. Yeah, very much so. Every yeah. day. Uh, I can't get out of this thing. I don't know what's going on here. I really like the movement in it. Thank you. Um, 
I'm afraid I'm gonna obliterate the whole document. I can't, I just can't figure out what I've done. Oh, let me escape, there we go. Okay. Back, great, very good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you again, Jane. Vivian, it is mm. your turn, my friend. Okay, well, first of all, I'm so glad to see everybody. Um, really glad. And uh, so many people have been published since I last saw you. Barry, John Williams, Mac, Estelle, Niles, a lot of other folks uh, in the low country. Uh, and June, I, I, I'm sorry for your loss. And, uh, um, and Susan, I, I thought about reading a poem, but I can't follow up on you. So I'm, I'm not going to do that. So this was from a prompt uh, we had this week up here in North Carolina, where you had to write something about memories that couldn't possibly be true. Mm. So this is really rough, but here you go. I remember a newspaper story about a woman seeing the face of Jesus in a piece of white bread. I think the piece of bread was posted online and I didn't see Jesus. In fact, wasn't Jesus the one that said, man does not live on bread alone. <laughs> Maybe it was mold, the beginning of penicillin, something the woman wanted or needed so badly that when she went to her bread box, pulled a slice of Wonder Bread to toast, butter and strawberry jelly at the ready, a cup of steaming black coffee close to her right hand, she went into some kind of trance, some altered state where people go for hopeless miracles. Hypnotized by the crinkle of plastic packaging, she may have heard a voice that still small whisper of her ticking kitchen clock tapping a message in Morse code. Look at me, I'm here between the crusts. I am in the shadows of your white bread. Maybe next time you should buy whole grain. Just then, she may have collapsed or swooned, convulsed, hurt angels, the piece of bread limp beside her on the floor. When she comes to, turning over, staring into the pale crevices of the bread's face, she sees her Jesus, her domestic savior. I imagine tears forming in her eyes as she sits up and regains her composure. Maybe Jesus doesn't exist between slices of Wonder Bread. Maybe he really does make house calls to visit gullible housewives making toast in their mid-morning cerebral fog. Maybe, but then again, we'll believe anything when our hearts are hungry. <laughs> wow. No, not bad for rough, girl. <laughs> I love that. That was great. It was really good. Was I, I love, Thank love you. humor in it. Also. Thank you. It also has a, a certain universality <clears throat> to it these days. People believing anything. Mm. They need to. They want to. What a great last not, last line, Vivian, and really paid it off. That was, that was good. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, you guys. Mm. Mm. So glad you're back. You're back with us, Vivian. Thank yeah, you. come again more often. <laughs> well, when I when I heard that Mac was reading tonight, based on Jane's invite, I thought about Duke's mayonnaise, and that was it. I, <laughs> <laughs> I it is so good that you said that. <laughs> <laughs> right, next up tonight. Uh, my friend Jane Zenger, who's joining us. And incidentally, a uh, quick plug, Jane will be with us in person at the Conroy Center, November 15th with another remarkable poet, Libby Bernardine. Uh, they will be, well, both be there that evening. So you'll be seeing more and more announcements about that tonight, but uh, later on, I should say. But tonight, we're very honored to have Jane with us on screen. So Jane, what would you like to read for us? Oh, boy, um, those are all so wonderful. Um, this is from the book, Night Bloomer, and uh, that I'll be reading from and talking about in, <clears throat> in November. And thank you so much, Jonathan. I am just 
delighted to be invited. It's, I wanted to publish a book. And then number two, I wanted to do something with the Conroy Center. So my life is done. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to read um, a piece called Overdue Maintenance. And it uh, has to do with, this book is in three parts. And the first part are the adventures and trouble that I got into as a young woman. Um, and the second part is uh, sort of it, traveling and going through um, seeing the world. But the third part is um, I lost Steve, my husband of 45 years, um, a year and a half ago. And so this is um, some of the work is sort of trying to reconnect and find yourself. <clears throat> and this is called overdue maintenance. We live on a farm outside of, still in the weeds. I live in a farm outside of Blythewood. And um, it, this is, has to do with what happens when you have to take over and do things yourself. It's called overdue maintenance. I am scratched and bruised with chigger bites in sacred places. That's what happens in the country when you cut brush and haul broken branches into the deep woods. I flail and whack away at my old life with chainsaws, clippers, and the dull old axe. There's so much to do what with the road blocked, with broken limbs full of potholes needing to be filled with gravel. And when I let it go, the weeds and straw take over. Meadows and flower beds become home to poison ivy, muscadines and sweet gum trees. Fire ant beds rise like tiny volcanoes in the fields where we once fought each hill together. There are tasks today to mow the meadows, shore up the fence where the deer crashed in, kill the wasp above the door. Without him here, I am the only one left standing, wondering how to crank that antique chapter mix the gas with oil, if that's what I'm supposed to do. It's not the hard work, but the loneliness of it all. Just me in the old solar shower he made one summer, rinsing off the mud and sweat way out there without a naked care. I miss the way lugged his thermos on his back, his apple pie, his warmth on a cold night. But I wanted this rural life, asked for it and will maintain it a little longer. And to the strong sisters who have been in this place, you know what I mean when I say, it is not the hard work that stings, but the sharing it of, sharing of it I miss. So. Oh, that's just wonderful. Thank you. Mm. Okay. I have some more uplifting ones. <laughs> <laughs> That was very poignant, thank you. Mm. It's a beautiful book, Jane. I, I so enjoyed reading it and I'm really looking forward to sharing it uh, with our audience thank in you. November when you come down in person. I'm, I'm delighted we get to do that for you. Thank you so much. Catherine, you are next in our lineup this evening. What would you like to read for us? So I'm gonna read an excerpt from um, a chapter called The Call, and it's in Driving Pink, so Driving Pink, and it starts in the narrative immediately after getting the call for um, a callback mammogram, so. Let me pause for a moment to give you a glimpse into my brain. I'm the one you want in an emergency. I don't rattle easily, and I can instantly engage in scenario analysis, rationally assess alternatives, and select a course of action. I've experienced major earthquakes, a tornado, and a few named storms firsthand. I was present when a mom thought her toddler ate glass. And while everyone else mirrored the mom's fear response, I walked around the rooms and quickly located the holiday ornament he'd sucked on, causing the red film to come off around his mouth. It looked like blood. I drove myself from San Diego to the hospital in Torrance, California with acute appendicitis. 
And when a storm swirls around me, my brain feeds me data. I'm calm and centered. The time for tears can come later as relief or release from everything is all over. And so it goes with this call. Yes, my personal equivalent of Spidey Sense activated. I'm hyper alert. I make my call to inquire about access to records and explain the scenario. And my prior provider tells me they can quickly accommodate the request. I get the location, call back my current provider and schedule the appointment. I grab my purse and car keys. With the tight schedule, I jump into the car, driving down the winding hill, something falls off the passenger seat and I instinctively reach to grab it and nearly wreck the car. I didn't wreck the car, but hitting the curb did wreck the tire, which is when I discover that in my haste, I left my phone at home. I hike back up the hill, call my husband to tell him where the car is and what he needs to fix it. I tell my son to pick up the truck keys because he's now going to be my chauffeur for the remainder of the day. And I grab the phone, off we go. At the facility holding my records, my son chooses to stay in the truck while I run in. And I'm routed to three different locations in the building before they send me to the right window. Thankfully, they have the records ready. I head out the door and my son and our giant white truck is nowhere in view. I find him in the adjacent parking structure. And I feel the pressure of time. The appointment is in another town just down the highway and traffic is unpredictable, but I'm not driving. So I just breathe deeply in, out, in, out. We arrive and I send my son to the cafe on the first floor and tell him I'll text him. I check in. I'm actually given a hospital-like wristband. Hmm. They explain that's in the case where there's a need for additional diagnostic procedures. They tell me where to wait. The technician comes out and explains there's a problem with the computers and they can't access my records. They're rebooting and please wait. Another woman who has also had a callback arrives. Her spouse is with her. The technician explains the malfunction. We wait. Finally, the computer's selectively accessed files, hers comes up first, so I continue to wait. The other woman's recheck is evidently clear from the conversations as they depart. The technician indicates we may have to reschedule, but give them a bit more time. And finally, the equipment stars align and it's my turn. I'm not surprised when the radiologist affirms there is an abnormality. The next step is an ultrasound and biopsy a few doors down. The practitioners are kind and professional. They explain what will happen. The numbing agent does not work for inserting the needle that takes a core of the suspected tumor. And I'm not surprised at that either. It's my normal. I tell them just do it. I'm used to gutting pain out. And the doctor takes the sample and positions metal markers like little grains of rice that glow on x-rays when the location in my breast where the offensive tissue is. I ask questions throughout the procedure and observe people carefully. We work through a few what ifs and the responses are appropriately non-committal. The sample will be sent off and I am free now to go home and wait for the next call. And sometime during the last hours I thought occurred, I'm now driving pink. Mm. Can you hold up the cover for us again? Let's have a look, please. Thank you. Please. Oh, okay. Catherine, is that is that a recent publication? When did that come out? I just did it this year. I haven't done any um, promotion or anything on it yet. I <laughs> I've had a I've had a year. <laughs> um, we. We I inherited some adults through the death of a family, and that required a lot of estate work and other assorted assorted things. So the fact that I finally got all of the permissions for quotes and you know sharing research and and all of that piece and just getting it 
out was the big deal for me. And so I, I looking to try and do more to talk about it as we move into October with breast cancer awareness. Well, it's excellent. It's excellent, Catherine. You really captured, you know, the the unknown, your feelings Thank you. while Thank you. while driving pink or unpink, you don't know. You know? <laughs> That's really, that was really well done. Well, it was I, interesting because I, that was the first concept of this idea of driving pink. And that was in 2014. And I literally saved the, the title, the, t you know, I, I just always intended that that would be maybe an organization or something that might help other people. And then, um, and then I started the book. So, excellent. We all wish writers never throw anything away. I yes, <laughs> exactly. I have little notes and journal books everywhere. <laughs> Good luck, Catherine. That's just wonderful. Wish you all the luck. Thank you. Thank you for joining us tonight. Too, we're, we're so glad you can be a part of our open mic night. Well, it's so, it's. I watched some of the videos of your prior. So I'm really looking forward to it. Hmm. It means a lot that you watched the videos and came anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, Casey was the one who, who emailed me and said, hey, this might be something you like. And I'm like, I'm in. Excellent. Uh, I find it best just to do whatever Casey tells me to do. That's it. <laughs> that is exactly right. That's exactly right. Easier, too. It's much easier. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan, uh, would it be too much trouble? I know this is my fault for not being able to be here when we started, but I'd love to know where everyone is calling from. I think since we I missed that at the beginning. Sure. Yeah, if you don't mind, um, I, we're not all in the same order in each other's screens, yeah. of course. Um, so let me help facilitate this. I'll we'll, we'll, we'll go in the order of reader. <laughs> so Niles, where are you joining us from this evening? I, I'm in Jackson, Tennessee. Uh, outside Memphis, mm -hmm. uh, which was very near where my mom was from until just recently. She was living in Medina until she joined us right here in the Low Country. Susan, I am in St. Helena or on St. Helena Island. Mm -hmm. Nice. Robin Prince Monroe had to eject to do another commitment, but she's uh, she joining us from Fripp Island and <coughs> Denise. I'm from Bluffton, South Carolina. Barry? Hilton Head Island, South Carolina. June? Oh, we may have lost June. Uh, no, there's June. Oh, June. You're, you're muted. Sorry, you're muted. So we didn't hear that. I'm in, I'm in Taylor, South Carolina, just outside of Brindle. Taylor's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Brad, where are you and Elvis joining us? From? <laughs> well, we just uh, came from Memphis into Beaufort, South Carolina, where we reside two blocks from the Pat Conroy Center, actually. <clears throat> yes. And let's see who's next on my list. Uh, Jane, Jane Adams. Left in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. Vivian, where's home now? <clears throat> Brevard, North Carolina. <clears throat> And Jane, you want to tell everybody, Jane Zinger, you want to tell everybody where you are this evening? I am outside of Columbia um, in Blythewood area um, in a place, a little place called Cedar Creek. Nice. And uh, Catherine, how about you? I'm in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. Oh, okay. Not far from us either then in Beaufort. Yes. Not very far. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mac, where are you and your ceiling fan joining us? Uh, yeah, we're in some stranger's home that we're renting in Hilton Head, South Carolina. <laughs> nice people, I assume. <laughs> Mac is in a transitional phase of his life, uh, but a happy one because he's got a brand new book out that uh, that will close out our evening with tonight. I get to I get to introduce our returning champion though, so let me do that, and then I'll happily turn it over to Mac. Following a career, which I'm told spanned law, business, and teaching, and I assume that to be true, uh, John McElroy began writing creatively in 2016 
after the publication of his first book, a co-authored collection of zany and mostly true stories, he turned to writing short fiction. His story, Dukes, was then named a Best of 29 short story, and he won the 2021 Amy Minnell Award and was a finalist for both the Coker Fiction Fellowship and the Excellence in Southern Lowcountry Writing Competition. These and other award-winning stories are now conveniently gathered together in his brand new book, Whatever Happens Probably Will, published in May of this year. And it is a great honor to have Mac join us this evening as our featured writer, and I'm very happy to welcome him. Welcome back, Mac. Well, thank you so much, Jonathan. And, uh, you know, we also appreciate uh, these events. And, uh, you know, in the spirit of things, I do try to kind of script something if I'm going to be kindly invited to be your featured speaker. But in my own way, I've kind of tossed it all out as I've so enjoyed listening to things. So I'm going to go off script, off off script, then back partially on script, but I'm still going to keep to my 15 minutes if that's the, the drill. That's so <laughs> if that's okay, and, and this is way off script, but Barry, when you were talking, this uh, it gave a little... Uh, presentation from your many memoirs, reaching back to your youth, uh, I do have a great little human interest story that writers like that uh, springs from my first book, Not Exactly Rocket Scientists, and Other Stories, which is still in print. And you can join the other 11 people who bought it if you go out there pretty quickly. But uh, it, it, it's, it's, as, as Jonathan kindly said, it's a compilation, co-authored compilation of zany stories from kind of kindergarten through high school. And one of the stories, and it was one of my favorites, if you, was a story called First Date, as it logically talked about the horrendously awkward and terrible first date I ever went on. And it described a lovely young lady. We were in eighth grade and we went on a bowling date. Nothing went right. You'd have to get the book and read the story, but it was an unmitigated disaster. I mean, this was a bowling alley in Ramos, New Jersey, complete, you know, with the thin guy that rents you the smelly, smelly, smelly uh, shoes to rent. I mean, that was the best part of the whole event. Anyway, one date, last date, Today, I had my second date with her, 62 years later. Her husband and she were down in Hilton Head. We called and got together for lunch. So my second date with the lovely Lynn was much better, accompanied by my wife and her husband. So 62 years, first date, now a second date. Funny, funny deep door. Um, what I thought I'd do tonight uh, and there's some people that have heard a number of these stories, so I'm going to probably toss out an option to you. But let me just give you a little bit of a sizzle introduction for the book. Not exactly rocket science, or, or, or whatever happened probably will. Um, I, I want to mention two things about it. The architecture of the book was kind of interesting. I've been writing, as Jonathan said, uh, for just about five or six years. I pulled together 18 stories. Uh, it's an eclectic collection. And, and people talk about trying to find linkages. Um, I really don't know how to do that. But I guess if there's any linkage from story to story, it, it's my sense that both in life and also in writing, writing fiction, some of the really interesting and important things that happy to, happen to us come from the everyday come from the common, and then they sometimes slide out to the unexpected, and even sometimes slide out to the far end of our imaginations. And, and that's kind of what I tried to do in each of those stories, try to find some place where we go from the familiar out to the unexpected. And uh, that, that can be in a humorous vein, it can be in a bittersweet, it can be tragic, it can be a gut punch from the beginning, or it could be kind of a subtle roll towards the end of the story. What I try to do in my stories is create an ending which is consequential to the reader. It has some kind of an impact. So that kind of gets me to um, what story I'm going to read. I was going to read Dukes, but I, how many have heard me read Dukes? 
Oh boy, okay. That's about <laughs> half. Uh, how about a, a story that I have not read in a long time, The Night Train? Oh, that's lovely. Oh, good. Let's go with that one. And again, a couple of you heard that. I think that will get me uh, get me over the uh, get me over the hump here. And let me go on. We'll find it. While I'm doing that, I want to talk for just a second about the title of the book. Uh, I put the collection together in the middle of COVID. And everyone was kind of wandering around. You know, it is what it is. Um, people were muttering, you know, if it can go wrong, it will go wrong. The misstatement of Murphy's Law. I mean, this is all swirling around. And amidst all that chaos, I decided to pick up the book called The End of Everything by Katie Mack. I mean, it seemed logical the way things were going. Katie Mack is an astrophysicist, well known. And the book, The End of Everything, is a layman's journey to the possible final curtain of our galaxies and, and our universe. And a fascinating book. And in that, she also teases the idea of multi-universes, multiverse, where every outcome for every event is a possibility and maybe likelihood. So kind of from it is what it is, if it can go wrong, it will go wrong, to everything is possible, threw that suit together, and we came, in, came up with whatever happens, probably will. Kind of catchy, I hope. Okay, let's find the night train on an audible. It's a short one, and I'll meet my time commitment. It's coming, boy. The night train, Grandpa? Yeah, the flyer. Lucas Petit paused, his voice deep and cloudy. He had been a railroad man, working mostly with freights out of Chattanooga on the Dixie Line. His massive arms told local folks that he was a locomotive fireman, his job to stoke the hungry coal-fired boilers on the rugged steam-belching monsters favored by the Southern Railroads, including his own, the Louisville, Ashley, and West Ashley Railroad. He turned to his grandson. You hear it? The boy cupped his ear as he always did, turning towards the darkness. Can't hear nothing, Grandpa. The boy walked to the edge of the porch of the house they now share, a tiny white wooden three-bedroom built on low brick support. The house sagged ever so gently, like most of the homes close along the old railroad right-of-way, houses burdened by the hard scrabble rural life and suddenly settling unevenly into the soft red virgin clay. He leaned out again. Nothing, Grandpa, nothing but them Katie digs and, and tree frogs. The boy paused. Yeah, and Miss Louise fussing at her dog again out past the barn. A light mist had started to fall, a young fog dancing among the live oaks and loblolly pines and the small patch of land they worked, beans mostly. Now it's coming, boy. The old man stared into the darkness. It's coming. Lucas had married a week after he hired onto the railroad, just months before the Great War, one to end all wars. Her people upstate would say later that they had hoped more for her than what a railroad man, an older man at that, could offer. Lucas was honest and kind and hardworking, and the railroads were doing well. The two of them quickly set out to build a life in the little white house, and it was a very good one. Just after her 21st birthday, they welcomed a son. He was born in the back bedroom, arriving to the sounds of the night train, racing its way south, heading to New Orleans. They named him Tony. He was a happy baby who grew up so quickly, they say, on the hard scripture of the local Reformed Pentecostal church, his mama's legendary biscuits and gravy, and the dusty red clay of the ballparks of South Georgia where his graceful play at shortstop, his rocket throws from deep infield to first base, legendary, caught the idea, the eye of several professional scouts. The senator signed Tommy a week after his graduation, 
sending him to their Southern Association double-A team in Chattanooga in June of 1941. Lucas swapped crews so he could take his boy up there himself. I took him up there, took him up there myself on the old uh, 1048, he liked to say to people. After the season ended, Tommy married a local girl, Mary Beth Tressel. It was just a quiet home ceremony, family and a few friends. As the local afternoon freight chugged its way past the little white house, the reception spilled gently onto the porch to hear its special chorus of bells and whistles. A little salute to the newlyweds, that's what folks always say. Tommy and Mary Beth just smiled as they knew that the engineer was Lucas' best friend. And four months later, Tommy was drafted and sent to Louisiana for basic training. And on a moonless night in April of 1942, Tommy's troop train sped past his boyhood. He looked, but he just couldn't see three people standing on the porch. His mom and papa, each holding a small American flag and their and his new bride holding an overstuffed teddy bear that Tommy had rung for her at the county fair a week after they were married, knocking down all the milk bottles, single bullet throw. They said they would agree on what to name it someday, but they never got around to it before Tommy left. No one knew then that Mary Beth was pregnant or that Tommy Petit would never play baseball again. Late in the war, along some nameless stream in some forgotten village in France, Corporal Tommy Petit caught a round in his right shoulder, shattering both bone and muscle. The bleeding was stopped just in time by a medic, and as Tommy wrote to Mary Beth, by the grace of God. He also said the docs did a pretty good job of patching him up, although he had lost almost all of the motion in his throwing arm. He told them he would be coming back to the States on a troop ship, docking in Brooklyn sometime mid-November. He told them he would then work his way home, the last leg on the night train. Lucas pulled a few strings to get assigned to the flyer for a few months, just so he could bring his only son home. Four days out, the troop ship was sunk by a tour. A week after Thanksgiving of 1944, the War Department notified the family that Tommy Lucas broken, quit narrowed a month later, and within a year, the Dixie Line itself was abandoned. The night was still and the boy restless. He had been through this all before, his grandpa slipping a few steps sideways talking about the night train again and walking out to the porch air into the darkness. Grandpa, the boy said so softly. He was almost eight now and he loved his grandfather. He also loved the father he had never seen, but it was so hard, like trying to capture a firefly on a hot summer night. But all the boys during the war had grown up so fast. No, son, your papa's coming home. He's coming home on the night train. The railroad man paused. That's what he told us. I know, Grandpa. He took his grandfather's hand and walked him slowly from the edge of the porch over to the two wooden rockers by the front door. Sit with me tonight, Grandpa, and tell me again how my papa won that teddy bear for my mama and how the fresh mowed grass in the old county ballparks they smelled in the early spring, and how you stoked the train that took my papa up to Chattanooga before the war. The boy paused, and tell me about the night trains too, Pop, and how they blow. The boy said. Oh. Well, I have it. <laughs> But I hope it's the impact that, as Always I said, makes uh, you cry. Uh, oh. Yeah, um, I, I, I think some of my Vivian and Jane know that I wrote that story 
just after I found out that my grandson was being deployed to the Middle East uh, a few mm -hmm. years back in war. So it uh, kind of hard for him to get through something. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway, that's uh, that's the story of one of eighteen. Hopefully, it packs an impact. And, and Jonathan, I'm going to brag just a bit, if I might. Shameless marketing. Please. About a month ago, uh, I got a note from uh, the International Book Awards people that I am a finalist in the International Book Awards wow. 2022 uh, in the category of short fiction. And I <clears throat> only tell my best friends that a finalist means I didn't win. <laughs> but I'm in good company. Congratulations. Great showing. Great, wonderful. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. The book's in soft release now. And uh, as some of my friends here know, we're hoping to do kind of a, a launch event in Beaufort uh, sometime in November uh, in conjunction, perhaps, uh, Jonathan, with uh, uh, a reprised Short Story America conference, which we're, we're hoping to do. So uh, hopefully it'll be uh, a chance for me to give it a little bit of a, an extra marketing push. But yeah. thank you so much for tonight. It's a great way to get some word out. Where else can uh, can your eleven or so readers find copies right now, Matt? Well, they they can they can go to uh, Amazon, or in the vernacular, they can pretty much buy this book wherever books are sold. Uh, the publisher, Short Story America, and they are part of the Ingram uh, Content Network. So. We actually have them stacked over here at Barnes & Noble, which makes me very, very happy. Right. It makes me less happy when I go back and see that the stack hasn't gone down. Mm. Uh, we're working on that. Give it time. And it, you, read, yeah. you read it beautifully. It's not just that it's amazing on the page, but your voice, the, what you bring to the story when you mm -hmm. read is wonderful, Max. Well, so you're, you're, you're very kind. And for, for some of the new people, uh, we really have to salute the Conroy Center uh, Vivian, I have to salute you because I think you brought me and Jonathan as a newbie into these readings. <clears throat> we used to do them at the coffee shop, which was also fun. But the discipline that you've asked us uh, to follow, to both select and, and carve out something is in, invaluable. And I, you, can't, you can't say that. You can't say thank you enough to what you're doing for us. Jane, my friend Jane, don't you agree? Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> the editing that you can do on the fly when you said Vivian whipping, whipping. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was. <laughs> no, I can't tell you. That's, it's been, um, it was a great skill you gave us. You, you made it, you drove us to. Really, really great. So oh, thank you. Nothing I yield back the rest of my time. <laughs> well, we've got a minute or so remaining tonight um so i just want to thank all of you all of you with us in the zoom room everybody watching this live on facebook everybody who will watch it on facebook or youtube these uh, these video recordings lead many lives and i hear about them long after the evening on which we hold them so it means a lot to to many of us that we're still able to do this and it means even more to get to see all of you on screen. So I want to thank you all for joining us. We'll get to do this again, as we do every single month uh, in September. On September 8th, our featured reader will be our friend Susan Cushman, who we've hosted in the Conroy Center, both in person and virtually, I think four times previously. Uh, Susan has a book <coughs> out called Pilgrim Interrupted, uh, which at the very least Niles and I are familiar with. So uh, we're looking forward to that. And I hope you all will come back as well. So any closing thoughts from anybody else before we before we depart? Yeah. Great group. And thank you again for sponsoring us, Jonathan. Nice evening. Very, very, very good. Thank you. Good night. Nice crowd. Good reading. Well, I miss you, Vivian. Wish you'd come back. I'll do it. I promise. I'll do it. And we didn't get to hear where Estelle was from. Estelle, where are you from? Oh, uh, St. Helena Island. There we go. Yeah. Good eye, Vivian. Thank you for that corrective. I appreciate that. <laughs> she whips you, doesn't she? Oh, she <laughs> whips. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody. Thank you.
very much. Thank Thanks, you. Mac. Great reading. Congratulations. Thank you.